Well, good evening. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis. This is Germantown Christian Center, and we've had a moment here. We've been able to visit and chat with everybody here in service, and so I'll just greet you that are joining us here online, and I hope you had a great day. And uh, if not, well, guess what? Let's make it a good evening right now. We're going to spend some time with the Word, give you a devotional that I hope will encourage you, let you know a little bit more about what God has in store for you, and remind you that He sure does care about you. He loves you a lot. And so tonight, if you will, we're going to be just looking at some things about tapping into the grace of God that is in your life and how you can walk in that because every one of us needs to pull out of us, we're out of our lives, what God's put in it. He wants to use it. He wants to capitalize upon the investments he's already been making in our lives and those that he will make in the future. And so tonight, if you will, if you want to get your Bible out, we're going to look at Romans chapter 5, starting at that first verse and some other ones as well. And we're just going to ask God to bless us to spend this time with us, to allow us to see that he is a, a great and mighty God, to reveal, as it were, a glimpse of his glory and the things he's got in store for us, because he's a God that is truly magnificent and more than enough. And here in Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at here about what you and I can do to tap into the ability of God, particularly when it comes to the grace of God. It says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know this is a scripture we've all probably memorized, we all know, but it reminds us the underpinning of our walk with, with God. The fact is we have been justified through faith. And you say, why is that important? You need to remind yourself that pretty much daily. You're not justified by your works. You're justified by faith. In other words, you're made right by God because you believed and trust in the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross of Calvary. You know, a lot of us are lulled into a false sense of, uh, of uh, performance-based type of righteousness. In other words, if we can just keep doing right, well, then God will love us more and that he'll approve us and that somehow we'll just, you know, that just, just get maybe more of his blessings. You know, it's not the way it works. God doesn't go ahead and love you more based upon your willingness or your, your, your track record of doing what he asks. You see, his love is unconditional. And I know you say, well, I know this, but see, here's the problem. It's insidious. And that is that some of these things sneak into our lives in areas that, that just help undermine what God's trying to perfect. You see, you know, a lot of times we get in there and you, whenever you miss God, and of course that's a euphemism for saying sin, and uh, you ever know how you feel really terrible? You feel like you blew it, you, you should have known better, and you're kind of you're down on yourself? Well, see, the problem is if that is allowed to fester, then you somehow think now, as it were, well, well God's, God can't bless me or... or or, you know, God can't really, you know, work in my life. And see, that's not true. You see, once you recognize you've blown it, again, that's a euphemism for sin. Once you recognize you missed it, same thing, what, you, what you've now realized is I've done that. So you take care of it by what the word says. You say, Father, forgive me, cleanse me from unrighteousness. I'm truly sorry. I'm repenting. I'm turning the other direction. I'm turning towards you. You know, just tell them you went temporarily insane. You know, and, and, and you just, you know, you, you know better, you didn't do it, you're sorry, or you didn't do it, you're, you're apologized, then just, it's, it's taken care of. It's under the blood. He doesn't remember it anymore. You don't have to live it down. And so when condemnation comes, that's just a tool of the devil. Remind yourself you're justified by faith. You're not justified by your performance. You're not justified by the fact that you've, you've done right for the last, you know, six minutes, okay? The, the fact is, you are righteous, you're made righteous because God declared you so. Because of what his son gave to you. He exchanged your righteousness for his. Now, that's a pretty great exchange if you ask me. And so, we says here, we have been justified through faith because that we have peace. Now, we've ministered on this verse before, but when you start talking about grace you realize that, that his grace is, is, is full of so many of these benefits. His grace, as it were, is an over, override, overreaching umbrella. And under that umbrella of grace, you have the fact that God loves you. Not, not, not meritously, not because of your merit, but because he chose to. You know, it, it's like, have you, ever, have you ever loved somebody to the point that you loved them not because of what they did for you, you just love them because you love them? Maybe you have a child that, that way, your husband or your, 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 you know, your wife, a, a, a friend or whatever. What I'm saying is it's a choice. It's a decision. It's really not a feeling. You've, you've made that decision to love. God has made that decision to love you. Not because, you know, you do what he says, though he loves it when you do that. 
Not because, well, you know, you, 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 you give a lot of money to the church. No, he likes when you're able to bless people and bless, you know, blesses the ministry and everything else. But he's not going to love you anymore because you give a lot of money. See, his love is, is declarative. His love has been stated by him, I love you. And nothing has changed. Nothing will ever change when it comes to that. So nothing we do can make God love us less or more. Now we can please him more and less, and that should matter to us. We ought to get up every day, and I'm sure you do. Lord, I really want to please you today. Would you help me? Now, you know, sometimes you may not always make the mark of what you should, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. I mean, you, you, you sit there and say, Lord, I really want to please you. Would you help me learn how to do that? And you know, realize that sometimes what we do may not be the best way to please God, but we're just operating by what knowledge we have. Folks, grace covers that. We get to the point where sometimes we compare ourselves with other people. And if you do that, it's dangerous. Because either you're going to set your standard too high and feel inferior, wretched, insignificant, or you set your standard too low, in which case, ooh, glory, I'm glad I'm better than that person. Both of those are not great ways to live. See, we're not, we're not basing, as it were, anything upon anyone else. We're basing upon, God, what did you have for me to do today? So, Father, I want you to know I want to please you. Would you help me and teach me how I can do that in a way that, well, glorifies you at the level I'm at right now? Because, after all, we all have limitations. I mean, you are only who you are right now. You, you're going from glory to glory day by day. So just understand, you're not going to be the person tomorrow that you are today in the name of Jesus. We used to sing a song years ago. And maybe, maybe you've heard this song, but I grew up, as it were, when I was a teenager. I remember the pastor that I, that I was, was uh, gotten to know. He's just a good friend. In fact, he's a, he's a, a great man. Uh, pastor Samuel Pack up there at, uh, years ago at Mount Holly. Um, you know, New Jersey. He's out out there at Egg Harbor Township now in New Jersey. But uh, we used to sing a song out there, and, and many of you may have heard it, but, you know, I'm not going to leave here like I came in Jesus' name. And, and it was a declaration of, you know what, we're going to get changed. It's amazing how you can set the tone, as it were, and, and we did as a service, like we came together as a church congregation, declaring we're not going to leave this church service like we came in Jesus' name. Well, folks, we need to live our lives that way, that every day we can look back and say, I'm going to be better than I was yesterday. We're going to learn more how, what God likes, how he wants, to, how he wants things done. We've got to learn, adapt to what God wants us to do, how he wants us to speak, how he wants us to, to treat others, our attitudes, all these things. We find them revealed in the word, but then we get to practice them in this world. And so here, when again, Romans 5.1 says that we have been justified through faith. So remember, nothing you do is going to make God love you more. Nothing that you do is going to make God, you know, think more of you. He loves you unconditionally. And we get peace because God declared us righteous. Then verse 2 says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. Well, you know, if you can stop right there and say it was the faith that you have, the faith that God has birthed in you, that is given, he's given to us. It is through this faith that we have, as it were, gained access by faith into this grace. So we're going to have to believe God for it. We're going to have to use our faith and say, Father, I thank you that I purposefully tap into the grace of God in my life. See, the problem a lot of us have is we're, we're tapping in to what we are. You know, a lot of people misconstrue God's grace for the force of their personality. And I'll tell you, your, your personality isn't as strong as the grace of God. Now, I know that's hard to understand because you all got great personalities. I mean, you know, I mean, and that's okay to have a personality. But the, the, the grace of God is a lot more powerful than a personality. There are certain doors you can't kick down with your personality, but the grace of God can open up and you can walk right into where God has you to be. It wasn't Moses' personality that caused the Red Sea to be parted. That was the power of God. And so we have to remember we are full of the Holy Ghost. As a Christian, you are full of the spirit of the living God. In fact, the Bible teaches us it was the same spirit of God 
that, as it were, that raised Jesus from the dead and even quickened the mortal body of Jesus, and it does ours. If that same Spirit of, of, of God, the same Spirit called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, lives inside of us, then it quickens her. It brings life to our mortal flesh, to our mortal bodies. So what I'm saying is we need to understand that as, as, as great as you are, greater is the one that's in you than even you. And all your glory of your personality and your perseverance and all those great attributes you have naturally, God's greater than even those things. And we have to tap into that by, by faith. Does that make sense? Sure it does. And then he goes on to say, in this grace which we now stand, we, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What it's saying is we are rejoicing in the promise God made that he knows where we're going and what he has secured for our future. Now, there's a lot of things that you, you don't under, you don't, you know, when you're 20 years of age, you're not really thinking about what happens when you die. Can we all agree with that? Listen, if a 20-year-old is obsessing with what happens when they die, we need to seek some help. Because most 20-year-olds feel invulnerable, don't they? I mean, I knew when I was 20. I mean, I wasn't thinking about things like that. I mean, you're just, I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, well, you're 20. Y'all know what I mean. Well, the Bible says, though, that we're standing in faith. We're not standing in who we are. We're standing upon the promise of God. And it says we're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. There is something we are rejoicing in. And this is the point. If you want to tap into the grace of God, rejoice in the promises God made and he is keeping in your life. Rejoice in those promises of his fulfillment that he's going to take good care of you each and every day. And that he has secured your future in heaven above. See, there are things we can rejoice about and it, it encourages us to walk free from fear and full of faith. And so I read this and I think, well, my word, I need to use my faith to tap into this grace. And a lot of times, sadly, as I said, we don't fully use our faith to walk in the grace God has freely given to us all. You've got to use your faith. Now, we all know how you release your faith. It's what comes out of your mouth. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. Remember, Romans 10 tells us that the way that a, that a man or a woman can become a Christian is simply by believing in your heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead. And confessing with your mouth, he is your Lord. It says, you shall be saved. The Bible goes on to say, Romans 13, verse 10, it say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What I'm trying to tell you is, that's how we as a believer walk by faith. We believe it and we say it with our mouth, with conviction, with faith. And so you and I need to live that way. Tell, tell the Father, I mean, with, with a full heart of faith, let him know, Father, I am walking in the, full, in the full force of the grace you have put in my life in Jesus' name. Father, help me lean not unto my own understanding. You could put it this way. Father, help me not to lean unto my own thinking, my own reasoning, or my own personality. Help me not lean unto my own anger, to, my, to, my, you know, to whatever tactic or manipulation some people get good at in this world. Because the world will make you something you don't really need to be. You want to be someone who walks in the grace of God. And, and we are, aren't we, by faith? Sure we are. So, so understand, use your faith. That's the first key about this. Purposefully use your faith every day. And it'll help you become a better person. It'll help you to become not someone God loves anymore. Because he loves you already as much as he's ever going to but it'll help you become more useful. It'll help you to become more impactful. It'll help you to please God more. And, and if you're a parent, you understand this. You love every one of your kids. You don't love one more than another. But you can get, you can get pleased by one more than you can the other at times. Isn't that right? It's like your spouse. Are there ever times that you say, well, I love you, you know, I, I heard, <laughs> I remember my wife one time in this situation or whatever else, and, <laughs> and, I, and I come up there and, and um, she had, I, I used her car and, and I knew it was getting low on gas. 
but it was just, you know, I was too, you just tired. I just didn't, and so I thought, well, you know, she can get gas, you know, where, and I, I pulled up in the house and her gas tank is, you know, toward empty. Well, she got in there the next day and she, of course, called me and let me know that, so what is this? You, you drove all my gas out of my car. I drove four miles. But that's not the point. The point is, I left her car with not much gas in it. And I said, I'm sorry, honey. And I said, I said, well, do you still love me? I love you, but I don't like you right now. Because she has to go and, you know. And, and the point is, sometimes you get to a point where, you know, you love somebody, but you may not like them as much right now for something. That, I want God to like me. I know he's going to love me, but I want him to like me. That I'm pleasing him. Don't you? But we got to use our faith to be able to walk in that. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him make you believe that you can't, that it's impossible for you. Yeah, it isn't. The very idea the devil's telling you something like that must prove that God has something better for you. Remember, the devil's a liar. He can't even tell the truth. So I always like this way. If the devil's lying to me, it's because he knows God's doing something good and mighty in my life. And he's trying to steal and rob it from me. And he's not going to do it in Jesus' name. So, so we have to use our faith. Something else that's kind of important is this. is You've got to be a little bit bold about this. And I know it's kind of hard because it seems like in today's society that we're really becoming marginalized and almost to the point of, you know, telling us to, you know, be quiet and sit in the corner. You can't, you can't, people don't want to really see uh, or hear a Christian, things that we, that we believe. And folks, it's a shame. There are certain things we believers ought not be bullied by the world into just acquiescing to. Now, I could get specific, but I think you probably know that there are things in your life that, you know, it's like you get scared. I don't want to open my mouth. I don't want to open myself up to this type of, of persecution. And it, 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 no one's immune from it. I mean, not long ago, I mean, my son was in a situation that, that um, you know, a, a particular school he went to, um, Christian school, was coming out with a, um, a situation that was queried of them about what their stance is on, on uh, certain relationships in the world. And they, they just said, we believe in what the Bible says, you know, and that is that, uh, you know, God is not pleased by certain behaviors. Well, he wrote and penned out a very eloquent, substantial, and godly response to some of these things. And, I mean, the long knives came out. Threats were made, and, you know, people were threatening all sorts of things. And, and he took a lot of heat, but it's amazing. A lot of Christians and mothers and dads around that had read these things were giving my son, um, you know, his accolades, but privately sending them messages and emails, you're doing a great job. Many of them, though, were hush-hush. Well, I, you know, I, they, they didn't want to expose themselves to, the, to the, uh, the specter of public ridicule. And I, and I, and I say this only because the, the devil knows that the way he can defeat you is to marginalize you and get you not to use your faith and not to speak what you believe. And we can't allow him to do that. We have to be bold. And you say, well, how can I use boldness to appropriate the grace of God? Remember Hebrews 4.16? Remember Hebrews 4.16? Okay, some of you may nod you. Well, if you have it, you may want to go read it. Okay? The Bible teaches us that we have to approach God by faith to, to obtain, as it were, grace to help in our time of need. There are certain things you and I as a believer need to approach God's throne room with some boldness and with faith. And that means you don't need to be ashamed because you're rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to be somebody who is able to be bold in the Lord and the power of his might. Not in the arrogancy of your own flesh or your own self, but in a boldness. And you say, well, how do I know the difference? Oh, you know the difference. Your, your heart will convict you if you're not. But if you, read the, if you just read the book of Acts... Even the, if you, throughout that, or even to the Gospels, you can find instances, whether it be the Apostle Paul or Peter or, or any number of others, 
when they were standing up proclaiming the truth and doing so in the face of persecution and obstacles, they did so with the heart and the intent of representing God. They were walking in the love of Christ. They were, they were you know, trying to minister to help others. Folks, our lives ought to be lived to the point where I want everything we say and do to be a, to be a blessing to help God you know, move into the lives of others and help them know him too. And so we need to come boldly into the throne of grace to find that which we need help in our time of need. And so know this, there's a difference between arrogance and boldness. Yes, but boldness is based on knowing the eagerness of God to do what he says. God is so eager, so eager to show he is faithful and true in your life. And so I, I look at that and I say, well, yep, we need, to, we need to come before the throne of grace. And you come before the throne of grace every day that we live. It's not just in prayer, but it's in your daily travels, your daily conversations. You can boldly proclaim what the word of God says. You know, and that's one of the greatest privileges I see. If it were like, in the, you know, I, I look at the, at the sermon that Paul preached, as it were, standing there and looking, as it were, over it. And they were, you know, just proclaiming, as it were, others their own arrogancy. And there he was standing up there, a little, one little voice, proclaiming Jesus. And power came down and, and confirmed the word with signs following. The thing that separates, as it were, the, the world from the Christian is that God backs up his word with power. He shows up. I, I put it this way, and I mean, I've, I've told the Father this. I said, I just love it when God has show and tell. I tell, them, I tell about Jesus and God shows up. He likes doing stuff like that. You know, show and tell. We need to be willing to do some telling so God can do some showing. Amen. It's kind of hard to, maybe if you remember, do you remember what show and tell is in, in like kindergarten? You'd bring your favorite toy or you bring something and you get to stand in front of your class and tell the class, show them what it is and tell them about it. You all know that, right? You remember that? That, that, was, that, was, that was a good thing. Was it helped you give confidence to stand in front of others and, uh, and you were able to tell something about what you knew. It gave you Give you an air of, 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 of boldness. It helped to you know, foster some of these things. Folks, we need as a believer to recognize that we, get, we need to show the world who Christ is. Not who they think he is. Not who they're trying to make or marginalize him to become. But who he is. There is no identity crisis with Jesus. He knows who he is. The line of the tribe of Judah. Someone that loves everybody. Even, even when they're not doing right. But he also knows he has something better for him, and he needs people to be willing to stand up boldly proclaiming the truth, walking in love, and letting them know that God's got a plan for their life. And it starts with a relationship with Jesus. Right? So we need to have boldness. You need to be bold when it comes to soul winning. Walk in a grace. And I've had people tell me, well, I'm just not very good with people. I'm saying, yes, you are. It's amazing. You're comparing yourself with someone else then. We talked about that at the very beginning, didn't we? Don't compare yourself. Because like if you compare yourself against someone, like, well, yeah, you, you, you always find someone better than you. But God's not comparing you with someone else. He knows and understands that there are people that you have that he will bring to you in your life that you are able to help minister to and bless. Those are the people that you're supposed to be walking in the grace of God to help. Don't look at the people around you thinking, I can't minister to them, and realize, yes, you can, because if God puts you before them, he can fill you with the spirit of boldness and grace and mercy to, to give them help, to help them. And that's what my prayer has always been most every day. Lord, would you help me to help somebody else? Help me to help somebody else. And you can do it every day. But you've got to use your faith to get this grace. So I, I know some of these things are, are, are common, but you may have heard them, but to me they're very uncommon because I see so many folks that just that need this. I mean, let me give you another verse here. You know, Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, a very common scripture, of course. But it teaches us that God is not a withholder. You know, if you, if you believe in God, then that's a great thing. It's an important thing. But you've got to believe that God, number one, is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You want to please him, don't you? We all do. And I look at this, and I'm thinking that, that, that we cannot believe that God is a withholder, 
because grace is nothing more than, as it were, an aggressive, benevolent inclination, as it were, to show us himself and to do good in our lives. God is really wanting to manifest himself through our lives and in us. You ought to get up every day excited for what is in store for you. I know we can because um, many of you know that as kids, maybe you, you know, you're, you're getting excited because you knew you were going to go do something. Maybe you were out at the beach somewhere and you were excited because you were going to go out and, and do something fun. Or you were, you know, you're at an amusement park and you're excited because here you are. We're going to go out and we're going to ride some rides. And you're, you know, or Christmas. Maybe at your house, you, Christmas is a big deal. And so you're getting up really early, excited, anticipating as it were. Hurry up, mom and dad. Get up, get up, get up because we want to go downstairs and see what Santa Claus brought us. There's an anticipation and excitement. I wish to God that we could have that kind of excitement when we wake up every day. Just, just anticipating, excited for what God has in store for us. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? I have to think that that's the way Jesus lived every day. He got up every day excited for the people he was going to get to affect, help, encourage, bless, heal, all for the glory of God. You see, he expected it because he was using his faith. And so I just challenge you, and I have to close, but I challenge you this. When you get up every day, use your faith. Have that expectation that, you know what, God, I don't always know everything you got planned for me. But I just am believing and using my faith that whatever it is, it's going to be good. Help me to listen. Help me to tap into the, the, the force of, of grace so that we can see good things done, people's lives helped and changed, and the glory of God manifested on this earth in which we live. Have that anticipation, that excitement. And then when you get up and you say, this is the day the Lord hath made, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. It's birthed out of that anticipation of God having show and tell. Because he does love to do things like that through the life of his kids. Amen? Amen. Well, praise God. Well, I hope you got something out of this devotion tonight. I just want to share with you that you can do it. Because it's been made for you to do. He created in you his heart, his love, his power, given you his spirit, all the tools that you need to be able to glorify the name of Jesus. So don't sell yourself short and never, ever think that you can't do something that God says with his help, you can and you will in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I appreciate you joining us this evening. Uh, if there's something we can do for you, I hope you reach out and, and contact us. We really mean that. We are so thankful for the time that we get to share together and the impact that we are praying that we're making in your life. And if you would like to be a blessing to us as well, on the screen are some ways you can do that. If you'd like to support this ministry and church, thank you again. Uh, we're going to be back here Sunday morning. I'd love to see you in person. We're going to be here in person, Sunday school at 930 and 1030 is our main worship service. If you would like to join us in person, come on out and have fun with us. Be a blessing, as it were, and be blessed. If you'd like to join us online, we'd love to see you then as well. We'll be online uh, on Sunday mornings about 1040, 1045 each morning, Central Time. And uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to do one of those two things. Well, until we greet you again, either online or in person, let me remind you as I, well, I do a lot. Jesus sure does love you, has a plan for your life. And always remember, Jesus is Lord. Have a wonderful evening and hope to see you real soon. Bye-bye now.